Now, let's give a warm welcome to the amazing authors and podcasters who are here to share their stories with you and answer your questions. Facilitating this segment and giving me a break is author and podcaster, my friend, Ryan Bell. You all know Ryan when he launched a blog in 2014 called A Year Without God, all about being behind his 19 years as a seven-day Adventist. Ryan is the National Organizing Manager at the Secular Student Alliance and the host of Life After God podcast. Please join me in welcoming Ryan to the stage. Ryan. Thank you, Frederick. Appreciate that. I want to invite the panel to come up and join me. Uh, we have a, an exciting author and podcaster panel for you today. Um, and we are going to share their awesome creations with you. So let me invite L.B. Sperling, Becky Friedman, Rebecca Hensler, and Thomas Westbrook to join me up here at the stage and give them a warm round of applause as they come up. So what I love about this today so far is it's really, and last night as well, featured creators. And you've just heard these three amazing artists uh, and their creation, their beautiful artistic creation, so amazing. And we have a group of creators up here as well, uh, podcasters, authors, photographers, videographers, all kinds of amazing stuff. So I don't want to take up too much time with introductions here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And we're going to start by just going down the line and letting each of them tell you what it is they do in a minute or two. And then we're going to ask them some questions to kind of get a little deeper into their work. So we'll just start with Becky on this end and just go on right down this way. Hi, my name is Becky Friedman. Thank you for welcoming me all the way from Tacoma, Washington today. Uh, this, this Washington on this side, we've got also good politics uh, to pay attention to there. I have been assisting in production and hosting for the radio program Ask an Atheist with Sam Mulvey for about six years. It's an eight year long running radio show and podcast, real radio waves and everything. You can find us at atheist.radio. And, uh, Instead of being a proselytizing Sunday show, we provide an opportunity to hear from uh, a panoply of opinions of atheists and talk about issues of interest to uh, humanists and atheists and other free thinkers and uh, topics of science and skepticism and things like that. And I'm really happy to be here at California Free Thought Day. So thank you. Uh, hi, my name is L.B. Sperling. I'm best known as the atheist who spent 10 years illustrating the Bible in Lego toys. I'm the author of uh, several books, including the Brick Bible and the Brick Bible for Kids series. I would like to talk to you today about uh, my latest project that I'm very excited about. It's called The New Morality. Uh, for far too long now, discourse about morality has been uh, it, public discourse in morality has been dominated by conservatives uh, and, and the religious right who take for granted that they have the moral high ground while smearing those on the left, especially agnostics and atheists, as having no morality at all. But frankly, nothing could be farther from the truth. Though it has gone unnamed and uncelebrated, I believe there is a common moral code uniting millions of liberal believers and non-believers alike. We are united in acknowledging and celebrating the fact that humankind has made great moral strides uh, over the course of history since the ancient days when the Bible was first written. You may have noticed that the Ten Commandments includes things like thou shall not commit adultery and thou shall not covet thy neighbor's oxen or slave, but then fails with tragic consequences to include commandments like Thou shall not molest children, or how about thou shall not enslave? Uh, this week I kicked off the new morality website with what I call the new commandments. It's my attempt to distill into ten fundamental rules how to be a decent human being in the 21st century. I won't read the whole list, but if you'd like to know more, please uh, stop by my table or visit thenewmorality.info. Thank you so much, LB. And that's a good reminder. Yes, let's give a round of applause. Uh, there's an author podcaster table over here on this side featuring some of the uh, resources that are available. And then I believe there were some at the 
registration table as well. So if you want to see the brick Bible photographs and, and books, amazing stuff, a long-term project. We'll talk about hopefully more in just a moment. Rebecca, your turn. Hi, I'm Rebecca Hensler. Um, many of you might know my story. Um, uh, following the death of my son, I discovered there was an entire lack of grief support appropriate for people who were grieving without a belief in a deity or an afterlife. And so I founded an organization. It's really just a network called Grief Beyond Belief. And we provide peer-to-peer -peer grief support venues for people who are grieving without belief in an afterlife. And um, one of the v almost immediate things that happened, literally the work that I, the week that I founded the Facebook page was people started saying, so where do you have in-person grief support groups? And I'm like, whoa, I'm one person with a Facebook page. <laughs> And, um, but that continued up until literally within the past week, people posting to the Facebook page, I need a in-person grief support group in Denver, in, you know, I mean, people ask all over the world. Um, and so what I have done to try to address that need is I've written something called the Secular Grief Support Handbook. It's really short, that was deliberate, so that people didn't feel like this is something I can't do, I have to read this whole book about it. It's a 60 page book with a chapter on the basics of secular grief and how people grieving without a God or afterlife belief differ from people grieving with religious faith. And um, then a couple chapters on how you figure out what your community needs and how to choose an appropriate approach to providing that support, what kinds of events, like all different kinds of events you could choose to hold. Um, uh, then there's a brief chapter on um, how to facilitate for those with no facilitation experience. And then just a whole bunch of activities and discussion topics for groups to use and an appendix with all kinds of resources. So I have a few printed out copies here. Uh, I just want to get them in people's hands. I want people using these, people who are in communities where there's a need for secular grief support to be using the handbook. And so that's really my goal right now is to get those handbooks into the hands of people who will use them. That's incredible. I know in, in my uh, deconversion experience and in the people that have reached out to me, this is one of the number one questions that I get asked, whether it has to do with death and dying or uh, breakups, divorce, all sorts of different types of grief. Um, I'm so glad that you're doing this work. And please go see uh, Rebecca sometime during the day and find out how you can get a hold of her book. Thomas, it's your turn, sir. So my background is a little different from most people's. I had a childhood that was... I guess you could say a cross between Jesus camp and the art of travel. I was a missionary kid who was raised in the former Soviet Union in a Muslim country right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So you can imagine how insane that can be. Um, I was raised in, you could say, indoctrinated into a evangelical uh, Christian faith from a very young age. My um, profession de foi, or statement of faith, came at about age six, baptized a year later. And um, it wasn't until a good 20 years later that you know your, your brain starts to develop your um, critical thinking skills and you start to um, have the capacity to question and to look into it. Uh, the, the country that I was raised in was the second most corrupt country in the world. The reason that it wasn't the most corrupt country is probably because somebody paid a bribe. But living in that kind of environment, seeing what a country that is classified as a democracy but is nowhere close and has um, more of a, an autocratic leader at the top, you're told not to question you know, the president, you're told not to question your religion, you're told you know, that you've got to just listen and take things on faith and just believe. And that's not something that I'm cool with. Um, I believe in, in freedom, freedom of thought. It's almost like when they drop the name of a movie, like in the movie itself. Um, I believe in you know, free thought. I believe that we should be able to, to question everything. And that that's, that's a fundamental human right. And without it, 
we lose everything. We lose our ability to determine our own morality. We lose our ability to, to think and to, to figure out where we want to go because our, our course isn't you know, plotted out for us by you know, religious dogma. So I, I set up a, I, I feel like I'm, I'm taking too long, but I set up a, a channel as I, as I fell in love with science. I, I started realizing that everything that I was raised with wasn't true, but the truth withstands scrutiny, and I wasn't afraid to question it. So I started a channel called Holy Kool-Aid, where I make different science videos, laser focused, that are hopefully convincing enough that I would have been able, uh, I would have had my mind changed as a, a creationist if I had seen them, so that others can come along and it's a resource that you guys can share with them. That, you know, if someone says that the universe is fine tuned for life, they go, they watch one of those videos um, and it's, it's there for you. I also have a podcast called The Here and How with uh, Stephen Woodford of Rationality Rules and Rachel Oates. And we explore big scientific ideas in like a longer format, like hour, hour and a half long format. Thank you so much, Thomas. Go find his YouTube channel, Holy Kool-Aid, and his podcast, the here, with the here and the How. The Here and How. Yes. So I want to ask a couple of you, and some of this is a little bit more, probably more obvious for some of you than others, but uh, let me start with LB and just ask you, how did you, especially with the brick Bible idea, where did that idea come from, and how did you stick with it for so long? Um, sure. So... Um uh, myself, I uh, had been raised in uh, the Episcopalian Church on the East Coast, and uh, I became an atheist when I was 13, but it was really that experience of um, when I stopped believing, but everyone else in my family and uh, all my friends, it seemed like everyone else I knew, and uh, I'm old enough that there was no internet to have you know role models and, uh, and other atheists. I didn't know any atheists, but... Being in that position just kind of made me fascinated by religion and its, and its hold on people. And I ended up studying uh, ancient Judaism and Christianity in college, and that's when I first read the Bible for myself. And it was, it was um, a life-changing experience for me um, in the sense that I kept reading it a story after story and, and thinking, I don't think most people have read this book. I don't think they know what's in this. <laughs> and it would probably be better if they did. So um, it wasn't until a couple years out of college that I got back into building with Lego as an adult and I put those two interests together and realized that Lego was a really useful storytelling uh, medium. It's uh, very eye-catching, it has the nostalgia element and you can tell really dramatic and bloody stories in a way that's a little bit more palatable. So. Uh, I started using it, uh, you know, I, I made a Lego Garden of Eden, a Lego uh, Adam and Eve and God, and um, started retelling the stories of the Bible, not just the famous ones, but the, uh, the ones that people haven't heard about. And um, it got a really good reaction right away. And um, it's been popular with crowds like the folks here today, free thinkers and atheists. Um, but I've done it in a straightforward enough way that it's also uh, gained a following among religious folks. So some, uh, some religious education camps or Sunday schools will use it too. And I think that's great because, you know, I'd rather have them reading my books, which are actually, you know, telling the Bible or kind of letting the Bible speak for itself rather than kind of tacking on morals or watering down the stories or changing them to be, you know, more palatable to uh, uh, modern morality, let's say. Yeah. And, and Becky, let me, I want to ask you about your radio show because if, I, I wonder if there, like how you got started in that, all this in like 60 seconds, like how you got started in that and whether there are radio stations like that that other people might want to explore the opportunity to do something similar where they live. At a time when a lot of things are converting over to the internet in terms of blogs and uh, curated uh, media and podcasts and streaming, um, we still wanted to be able to bring um, awareness of what it means to be an atheist, what it means to think as atheists do, which is very varied. And we wanted to be able to do that in a medium that is accessible to folks that wouldn't necessarily seek it out because they're rabbit holing through Wikipedia or YouTube channels. And there still is a place for terrestrial radio. And right now there's a really cool movement called Low Power FM Radio. Um, and we work with two radio stations in the Tacoma, Washington area. And those stations are looking for content that's locally produced. And it's a great medium and venue for some of the smaller voices that aren't heard. We also love to put our programming on Sundays because when you tune into some of the lower market third tier radio stations, what do you hear on Sundays? It's mostly the preaching. 
And so to provide that diversity of thought to people that are just passing by, flicking through the scan on their, on their car radios and things like that, that's really what we wanted to provide. And again, not the atheist opinion, but listening to the diversity of voices for what's meaningful to atheists, free thinkers, humanists, skeptics, and scientists. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. And I hope maybe some would explore that in your community as well. Um, to Rebecca, I just wanted to... You, you mentioned something in your opening statement about uh, people immediately wanting these in-person... Because when people think of whether it's therapy proper or whether it's a support group type of situation, um, people immediately think of that as an, an in-person experience. Um, so are you or will you be developing training people to hold those types of support groups and does that exist already or can people get involved in that way? That's a really good question um, and it's something I'm really happy to do for any community that wants me wants to bring me out says we want to do this but we don't feel real ready to do this on our own can you come out and either talk to us about how we could do it ourselves or do one group Often what I do for a good example was um, I actually had this amazing opportunity last year for the first time to go speak to a non-secular community of mainstream grief support providers. And this was in Minneapolis. This was at the Minnesota Network of Hospice and Palliative Care Conference, which is the Midwest's largest end-of-life conference. They, they, they market themselves that way. I know my wife kept saying the Midwest's largest end of life conference. I'm like, yep. And, um, but it <laughs> gave several me of them, an op I guess so. Um, and, but it gave me an opportunity to talk to about 70 chaplains and hospice workers and to talk to them about how to better serve our community. And so that is one direction I'm really excited about going is there are all these people providing grief support all over the country and we are the one population where there is no training on how to provide for us. It is a terrible lack because if you go, if you're in a program about providing grief support, you are going to be taught this is these are Jewish traditions around death. This is how to serve the Muslim community. This is how Catholics, you know, grieve. This is how Catholics from uh, Central and South America grieve. You get these cultural um, trainings about serving different populations, except ours. And so it's really important to me to be able to provide that to the people providing mainstream grief support. But at the same time, I was also able to go talk with the Minnesota atheists and then afterwards to do a grief. So I gave a talk, but then to do a grief support workshop with them. And I'm always happy to go to communities and do that. I'm also going to be doing a webinar soon on how to use the handbook to plan and provide grief support events. Mm. And so um, as soon as that's done, I'm going to get that up on YouTube so that everyone will be able to watch that. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. And in the, in the moments that we have remaining, I want to pose a question that all of us, uh, not me, but all of you, uh, can think about and respond to. I know in my own podcasting and, and, and my own work, the, the specific sociocultural political moment that we're in has had a big impact on how I think about literally everything. Um, the, the rise of the, of the Trump regime, if we can uh, call it that, and, and the way that it's sort of uh, put a bunch of issues front and center that maybe we hadn't centered a couple years ago. How has the past two years political environment um, impacted the way you think about your work? Has it changed your content at all? Has it made you go in different directions uh, if, at all? And let's start at, with Thomas with you at that end. So I was at the ACA, the Atheist Community of Austin, where they shoot the uh, Atheist Experience show when the election was happening live. And I was sitting there watching it and watching the votes you know, go in favor of Trump. And I had already decided that I wanted to go full time into secular activism and start making movies. But the second that Trump won, and then I watched the subsequent, as the, the months rolled out, I, you know, I saw who his, his picks were for his cabinet. 
I saw people like Betsy DeVos, who's, you know, in, in charge of education, and, and she's denying that evolution even took place. You've got, you know, climate change deniers, you know, in, in charge of our, our, you know, energy. Th th this is insane. And so in order to try to combat this, this era of not just fake news, but science denialism and anti-intellectualism, we have to step up and we have to start speaking out. But we also have to educate people. Because when you roll over a bunch of vegetables, it's pretty easy to get your agenda done. And so my, my goal with all of this is to take you know, people who, yeah, they, they might be watching you know, the Kardashians, or they might be reading tabloids, or they might be just consuming garbage, you are what you eat. And it's like you may not remember all the meals that you've eaten, nor the books that you've read, but subsequently they make you who you are. So I'm trying to give people the, the, the base, the, the knowledge and the education that they need to be responsible citizens, and hopefully to push back against this madness. Woo. Thank you. I think for me, there's, you know, a couple things. One is the managing to keep providing grief support in a way that um, does not... I have to let people who are Trump supporters into the group. That's the hard thing, right? Is if my work is to provide secular grief support to anyone who is grieving without belief in God or an afterlife, I don't say anyone except this person. And that's incredibly hard for me uh, emotionally. I think the other hardest thing is just to make time for grief beyond belief when I want to be in the streets raging all the time. Mm. Go ahead. Um, yeah, for me, the last couple of years, um, uh, <laughs> it's been revolting. And the effect uh, uh, that it's had on me is to want to uh, work on a project that's going to um, affect things in a very direct way. And um, I, I started this off by talking about my new project, The New Morality. And I just, I, I feel it's important because um, I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of, of folks on the right and uh, evangelicals um, dominating conversation about morality in our country. And I really think the left needs to come together, both uh, believers and not. I think there really are basic moral precepts that we all agree on. And so I'm trying to just kind of give it a name, that, uh, a banner that we can all fly and, and use to kind of come back against the right and say, no, see, you're the ones being extremely immoral. And if you want to put your morality up against our morality, we're ready to do that any day. We started out our show, Ask an Atheist, with an editorial policy saying, hey, we don't talk about politics unless it directly intersects with atheism, skepticism, or the separation of church and state. <laughs> and then 2016 happened. And we said, you know what, we can't be silent about this anymore. We understand that atheism is a position on the existence of God, not on your political affiliations, but when a entire political party's platform excludes you and is trying to institute uh, uh, religious dominionism, when, uh, you, when you have things that are against the, uh, the aspirations of what it means to be a humanist, we find that we do talk about politics and we need to and we find that urgency and we're not afraid that, hey, just because our perspectives may not resonate with all atheists doesn't mean that we stay quiet. And that's how the recent socio-political environment has really affected and changed our show. So we talk about things like the uh, detention of, of, uh, of folks without legal residency status. We talk about school to prison pipelines. We talk about um, where uh, housing inequality and access you know, might affect us in, in a greater community, but then also from the perspective of atheists and humanists and things like that. Um, I know as we close out, I do want to give a shout out to uh, Radio Tacoma. Our executive director is actually here. She happens to be in California, and that's Louisa, and she's waving. Um, and between RadioTacoma.org and KTQA, that's like K, Tacoma Questions and Answers, dot org. Um, that will be our first radio station, as per my knowledge, on the West Coast that is uh, founded on and guided by secular humanistic principles. So we're really excited about that. And uh, again, you can find our show at Atheist.radio. 
Can I say one yeah, thing? Yeah, why don't we just go down the line and say where we can find your material before can, we close. Can, can I pipe in one sure. comment on um, the, the Trump thing? When Trump came to office, I realized that we need to build, build a wall. It's just not the wall you think. And to quote Christopher Hitchens, Mr. Jefferson, build up that wall. A wall of separation between church and state. Um, all right, I'll just take a minute to say, um, so you can visit me over at the table here. You can see any of my books that are uh, illustrating the Bible in Lego. I've got a couple other history books in Lego. Uh, the books are for sale over by the sidewalk, um, and you can find my material online, thebrickbible.com uh, and thenewmorality.info. Thebrickbible.com and thenewmorality.info. Whoops. There, yeah, there we go. So you can find Grief Beyond Belief and the Peer-to-Peer -peer Grief Support on Facebook. Just search Grief Beyond Belief and it'll come right up. Um, you can get a hold of the Secular Grief Support Handbook by uh, emailing griefbeyondbelief at uh, gmail.com. And if you're interested in reading more about grief uh, that is you know, without faith, um, griefbeyondbelief.org. We have a blog and we have a library of writing and video and audio that is about grief. So you can find all of my videos at youtube.com slash holy Kool-Aid. It's on my shirt as in don't drink the Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid um, with a K. Also, um, my website, holykoolaid.com, facebook.com slash holy Kool-Aid, Twitter at holy Kool-Aid. Um, and then my podcast is The Here and How, or you can go to thehereandhow.com and, and watch it and listen to it all there. And you can find my podcast and uh, the work that Life After God does, which is not super dissimilar from Grief Beyond Belief, though that is much more specifically focused on grief. We're also helping people going through deconversion and the process of faith transition. You can find us at lifeaftergod.org. You can find me on Twitter and in the very conveniently, David put our panel in the center fold of your program, so it opens naturally to the panel. And you can find people's Twitter handles here, website links, all the good stuff you can find about how to follow up with all these wonderful people. And one of the great things about an event like that, that's this, that's kind of intimate and cozy, you can actually find these people wandering around today. So come say hi to them, ask them questions, find out how they can inspire your creativity. Thank you so much for your kind attention. <laughs>